Hey everyone, today we're going to do some AP Biology Biochemistry re Review. This is going to be useful for those of you who might be studying for my AP Biology midterm, or for those of you who are trying to work on the challenge focus area for my regular biology courses. Now, keep in mind that this is just a review. This is not a comprehensive guide for any of these topics. So please use this as a review resource for some really important topics, but go back and use our other resources if you're stuck on understanding certain concepts. First, we're going to talk about properties of water. So we know that living systems depend on properties of water because of its polarity and its hydrogen bonding. Um, and we use water and nutrients in the synthesis of lots of new molecules all over our bodies and for all other organisms. So for example, in photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water to help us synthesize uh, our organic compounds. And of course, water and other nutrients are essential building blocks for new molecules. A couple of really important water things. Um, water has polarity, which helps it become a powerful solvent. And so what that means is that it can form hydrogen bonds because of differences in electronegativity in the actual molecule. So water molecules are attracted to other molecules that contain charges like in ions um, or partial charges or other polar mo molecules. Water also has cohesion and adhesion. So wa water, of course, is attracted to other molecules and water is attracted to itself. And this is because, again, of the hydrogen bonds that is that are formed. So the attraction between the oxygen of one water molecule and the hydrogen of an adjacent water molecule is going to help with this. So we also have um, a high specific heat capacity. We also have the idea that water is our universal solvent. It also has a high heat of vaporization, uh, heat of fusion, and some thermal conductivity as well. Lastly, when we're talking about high specific heat capacity, this is also caused by these hydrogen bonds, um, and this is the amount of energy that is absorbed or lost uh, by one gram of substance to change the temperature by one degree Celsius. And because water molecules form so many hydrogen bonds between each other, we need a lot of energy to break down those bonds. Now onto organic compounds. And remember, when we're talking about, about organic and biology, we are talking about substances that contain carbon and form our essential structures within our cells. This is not something to do with growing things without pesticides or avoiding GMOs. Organic in this context is referring to carbon. So of course carbon moves from the environment to organisms where it's incorporated into carbohydrates via, via different metabolic processes, um, sometimes converted into proteins, nucleic acids, or fats. So our four main groups of course are nucleic acids, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, and lipids, and so let's go through these one by one. Our nucleic acids include things like DNA, RNA, and ATP. Don't forget ATP is a nucleic acid. We have a nucleotide, which is our building block or our monomer of our nucleic acids formed by a nitrogenous base, such here as guanine, our sugar, so in DNA it's a deoxyribose sugar, and then a phosphate group here. Carbohydrates are used for energy production. We're going to have our monomers, such as glucose, built during certain reaction pathways. So photosynthesis is going to trap free energy in our sunlight that is going to produce carbohydrates from carbon dioxide and water. Of course, these carbohydrates are composed of sugar molecules, and the way these structures form their bonds um, is going to determine the property of the particular molecule. So if you want to look at the difference between cellulose and starch, for example, us humans, we can digest starch fairly well. We cannot digest cellulose, and starch has sort of a helical structure because of the bonding. But cellulose, we're going to have different types of glycosidic linkages between these monomers to form the polymer. So what happens is we get these long, straight, non-helical chains in cellulose, as you can see in the diagram here. These are flipped upside down uh, in each different bonding. And so these chains can cluster together to form really uh, large parallel bundles um, that are held together with hydrogen bonds, which makes it much harder to break down. But it's going to give plants their rigidity, um, which is really important, especially at the cellular level. Another important carbohydrate we should mention, of course, is glycogen, and this is stored in the human liver, and it's going to be one of our uh, forms of long-term energy reserves in the body. Now, of course, I don't need you to memorize any particular structure of these polymers, um, but just recognize that we do have the larger carbohydrates built up of our singular carbohydrate monomers. Now let's talk about lipids. These are super important in membranes. In general, we're going to have lipids be nonpolar. Um, phospholipids, though, as we see in our diagram here, have a hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tails, um, and so this is going to help with our phospholipid bilayer, our membrane structure. And moving on to proteins. Remember, proteins are made of amino acids. Right here we have one amino acid, and the amino acids aren't going to differ too much except for in this R group here, and that's going to determine the properties of that amino acid and then the resulting shape that the protein will fold into. So the specific order of the amino acids in a polypeptide 
um, is going to be our primary structure, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And of course, it'll interact with its surrounding environment, and this will determine the overall shape of the protein, which will then determine what that protein does. Remember, structure dictates function. Um, this R group could have different properties. It could be hydrophobic, it could be hydrophilic, and then the interactions of different R groups on these amino acids are going to determine what that protein does and how it's folded. And don't forget, we have 20 essential amino acids that are going to help build all of the proteins necessary for life. So now we're talking about one particular type of protein, and these are enzymes. Of course, we have so many enzymes um, in living systems that do lots of different things. They're going to catalyze so many different chemical reactions, um, such as the production of ATP. We have genes being synthesized with DNA polymerase. We have restriction enzymes to help us do things in biotechnology. Um, we have enzymes involved in signal transduction pathways. So enzymes are involved in a ton of different important um, biological systems. For enzyme-mediated reaction to occur, we have have to have a substrate that is going to um, be able to react with the active site or um, have complementary properties with the active site, and so it's got to fit. Of course, the shape is really important for enzyme as well. Enzymes can be denatured, just as any protein can be denatured, and that means our amino acids are going to unfold and the structure will be lost, um, so this would result in a change in function. One important thing to remember is that enzymes are going to decrease the activation energy required for chemical reaction to occur. So here we have two graphs. One is the progress of the reaction and the energy uh, required without the enzyme. Gosh, and here we have the progress of the reaction with the enzyme where there is less energy required for that reaction to occur. Sometimes you'll see these graphs superimposed over one another and you'll need to identify which particular line is the reaction with or without the enzyme. And because enzymes lower the activation energy, typically you'll see there's less energy required um, for the reaction to occur when the enzyme is present. Um, at the end here we have our potential energy of the product and here's the energy required for that reaction to get started. Again, enzymes lower the activation energy required for our reactions. We can measure a rate of an enzyme-mediated reaction by the amount of substrate that is being used up. So that's a good way to measure enzyme activity in an experiment. So let's talk a little bit more about protein structure. Again, this is super important when we talk about enzymes. So our primary structure is going to be the order of amino acids. So the order of the amino acids is going to determine the three-dimensional shape of the protein. It will have different R groups for each amino acid, and those are going to determine which amino acids need to be tucked inside the protein. For example, hydrophobic amino acid may not be exposed in this protein structure, and then the interactions between the R groups are going to determine how that protein is actually folded. When we get to our secondary structure, we have these things called alpha helices and beta pleated sheets, and these are the two main secondary structures in a protein. And this is when we have hydrogen bonds between these amino acids, allowing uh, these chains to twist together or to fold together in a certain ways. Now, when we get to our tertiary structure, this is a particular uh, tertiary structure of a human uh, protein called artemin. This is a neurotropic factor. Um, it's a type of a ligand. This is going to be our 3D structure, so think tertiary with a T, 3D, um, and all the subunits are folded up already, and so this is where we get the 3D overall shape of the protein. When we get to our quaternary protein structure, this is when we have two or more polypeptide chains or subunits associated to form a single protein. So these are uh, this is a common example, which is hemoglobin. So we have several subunits. We have four subunits formed to create that single protein structure. All right. Lastly, in this topic, um, in the challenge focus area that I have my biology students do, uh, we do talk about functional groups. Now, these specifically are not part of the AP Biology curriculum, but I recommend reviewing them because being familiar with the functional groups can help a great deal with how uh, molecules are going to behave in reactions. And I have a whole other video on that, which I will link um, on this as a resource for you guys. I hope this information has been helpful in your review, and please make sure you go back and use other resources if you need a deeper look at any of these topics. Thanks!